This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. UFOs, Angels, and Gods. This week on A View from the Bunker. Imagine a wave of terror attacks across our country. Unexpected, shocking, deadly, and provoked by a single email. The government responds with lockdowns and lockups of anyone with unapproved ideas, and uh, they add in mandatory vaccines. That's the premise behind my novel, The God Conspiracy, and your response to our special offer in the month of August was so overwhelming, and, and we are grateful for that, that we've decided to extend it. The God Conspiracy plus the theology behind the novel, 12 hours of our video teachings taken from presentations we've recorded over the last five years. 12 hours of video in all on four DVDs, all together, a $120 value. We're offering it to you during the month of September for just $35 plus shipping and handling. It's a compelling story that I hope you appreciate, but more than that, the video teachings on the long supernatural war in which we all play a part from Eden to Armageddon. Take advantage of it now. Available online at the Gilbert House store only, gilberthouse.org. And we thank you for your prayers and your support. The world is far stranger than we've been taught. It's a lot more like the X-Files than uh, most people would like to believe. In fact, most of us in the church would rather find naturalistic explanations for everything rather than assume, as our early church forefathers did, that there was a supernatural world that is far more real than what we experience every day. Uh, joining us today is a gentleman we've had on the program previously, but it's been several years and far too long, actually. He's the producer of a documentary film called UFOs, Angels, and Gods. And he was early on this subject and putting this together because this uh, involved research he did back in 1996 through 2001 before seminal works like uh, The Supernatural Worldview by Chris Putnam and Dr. Michael Heiser's Unseen Realm, Reversing Hermon and other things. We are proud and honored to welcome back to the program Ali Siadatan. I had it before the program. Siadatan. Well done. Thank you, Derek, for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I practiced all morning. Uh, forgive me. Well, it's uh, it really is difficult being the first one out there with a new concept that really requires people to change their paradigms. Uh, we're, we're talking with a friend now, an archaeologist, Dr. Doug Petrovich, who's uh, who's presenting evidence to the world that uh, the Hebrews could write as early as the time of Joseph, and we're doing it in wow. Egypt using modified hieroglyphics. And of course, the scholars, the accepted narrative is that the Hebrews couldn't write until maybe the uh, ninth or 8th century BC, and yet yeah. the evidence continues to build. But Doug's head was the first one over the wall, so he's the one who's being shot at. Uh, likewise, it took you some convincing to, or some talking to convince people that uh, there was a connection between UFOs angels and God. Some would see those as almost three separate topics. Right. Well, they say it's a superpower to be able to change your mind. And uh, it, uh, yeah, um, it, 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 there was a, it was like a puzzle coming together. Um, I, I became a believer in the Lord uh, Jesus in 1991. And I spent the first two years of my life trying to understand what that meant. Like, you know, the whole idea of the atonement sacrifice, how it related to the Old Testament law and prophecies and why is it that I had received the Holy Spirit as a result of that and suddenly felt united with God, um, something that I was deeply seeking. Um, and then in 1996, 1997, I was a graduate student at the UFT. I was doing a master's degree in French language and literature, and I was attending Bible studies in, you know, in the, in the community that had brought me to the Lord. And there, um, you know, the teacher kind of... Um, made a reference that there may be a connection between uh, the world of angels and the whole idea of UFOs. And I thought, wow, this is fascinating. I had not really turned my attention to the study of biblical angels. I just took them as a granted, like they were in the book, in the story. Oh, uh, the tomb of uh, Christ, you know, here's an angel rolls it over. Okay, great. You know, these are ministering angels, they're angels, they're angels. And, and even, you know, in, in the Middle Eastern tradition, the Islamic tradition, angels existed. So angels were just there in the background. Had, my mind hadn't really focused on it. But when he said that and we read Ezekiel chapter 1, it really, you know, shook me. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And that started the uh, my, my study in all of this. And there wasn't a lot of literature around. I mean, unfortunately, you had to consult some of the ancient astronaut theorists because 
that was the only thing that was around. And, um, uh, you know, you had the intelligence and discernment not to fall in the trap of their perspective, but to rather use their research, you know, uh, as a way of sifting through information that they may have plucked out that was interesting biblically, ultimately. Um, and that led to the study of the sons of God and the Nephilim, and, and that was, wow, this is this is very literal, this is very real. Um, and eventually, you know, the whole idea um, was expanded. I came across Chuck Nussler's work. He had written a book called Alien Encounters, and it's okay, he was talking about it. At that point, I had, you know, I think learned everything that he did. Uh, but I did go to university a library because it was the most advanced one in the whole country, and I put in the word Nephilim into Yahoo. Google didn't exist yet. It said zero search results found. <laughs> and the, uh, so the research was mainly done through books, and there was you couldn't go too far with that. Um, and then one day as I came up to see, uh, the, you know, to, to study, the gentleman said, I know where the throne of Satan is now that we were studying the angels. And I said, really, where is the throne of Satan he said it's in Pergamum. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he pointed me to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, where the Lord writes a letter to to the um, uh, church of Pergamum, and in, in which case, oh, sorry, someone's calling me to put that <laughs> airplane mode. So um, I went looking for it, and uh, it led me to the Library of Archaeology of the UFT, uh, which was part of a museum, Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, stuck to campus. There I found the writings of Carl Human, who was the archaeologist, German engineer turned archaeologist, who dug up the altar of Zeus. And in his notes, he said, if if Christ was referring to anything uh, architectural, uh, when he said the throne of Satan, it must have been this. And I photocopied it. I don't know if people remember photocopies, but I photocopied it and I came back. I said, "Look, the archaeologist, you know, uh, agrees with you that this there may be a connection here, and the connection has to do with with Zeus." And we thought, "Well, this is the question we instantly asked ourselves, which was, wait a second, is the Lord leading us to understand that there's a connection between the fallen angels and the gods of the ancient world, and whether this, in fact, is one of the masks of the chief of the fallen angels?" This idea, and I, with hindsight, I believe it came from the Holy Spirit. And then that opened, you know, the, the now I wanted to know about the gods. Now I knew that we believed the gods were mythological. When I say we, I mean the general culture of Christianity and of the academia. So I thought, well, there's no point. I've read a lot of things about these Greek gods and other gods. I'm not going to find anything. Uh, and so, again, I turned to these um, ancient astronauts. And, of course, Sitchin was the guy who was right, specialized right. In, in the Mesopotamian gods, even though he has his own, you know, weird ideas about things. But as I said, I was able to discern through that. I wasn't interested in his weird ideas. I was interested in maybe something he's found. And um, I, mean, I read everything he ever wrote. I spoke with him on the phone and I realized, yeah, I see the Eloni, you know, that the, the Akkadian like Babylonian, you know, the gateway to the gods. Uh, this is interesting. So, yeah, I, I, the, all the tablets talk about it. It's the chief subject of actually the library of Ashurbanipal, for instance, in Nineveh. Um, they attributed this tremendous birth of post-Diluvian civilization to this contact. The entire birth of civilization, urbanization, was really a restructuring of the world from the patriarchy of, of tribal clans, like the one we see in the story of Jacob, to the idea of these priest gods, who priest kings, sorry, uh, who were now the rulers of these cities in the south of Mesopotamia. There were priests, there were kings, they were also called shepherds, shipar, uh, Enlil, you know, which he translated as a righteous leader and connected to Melchizedek as being like God was taking Abraham from the, the polytheism of Mesopotamia and saying, this is my righteous leader. And of course, um, Lugal, all of these terms that uh, that are now everyone's talking about. And and you know, I remember in 1998 coming and telling the gentleman uh, with whom I said, you know, I think there's two guys in Little Inky. The question is, which one is Satan? And so that was kind of the beginning of this idea that wait a second, so the gods of the ancient world may have been the fallen angels, and and kind of the breakthrough came from Revelation chapter two. Um, I went to Iran to bring a prophetic message to my dad concerning um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 30 and 39. Mm -hmm. I wanted to warn him that if such a war occurs with Israel, even though he can't do anything about it, he should not 
you know, agree to it with his conscience that God's judgment is against Iran. And so in that trip, you know, he was baptized, his wife was baptized, and many other people. I mean, the Lord just came in. It was a powerful trip. Praise God. And, yes, praise the Lord. And and we had a UFO sighting on, on, on in the deserts of Iran. And so after that, when I came back, I really had to look into this whole thing. Reading about it is one thing, but seeing something like that is is different. It makes it so much more real. It brings it from the world of you know academic cogitation to the possibility that this is real. And then you know some events happened that led, led to let's make a documentary about the biblical view. So now I went deep into the research, and I wanted to know what the Bible said about the gods. Uh, since now I was going to talk to the world about it, my own impression, you know, of, of, of peering through the sands of a biblical scripture might good, be good for friendly conversation, but not for, you know, presenting something to the rest of the world. Um, I was running weekly Bible studies at this point, uh, and one of the gentlemen, he uploaded a new software on my computer called eSword. And I was like, okay, let me see if this thing, you know, I looked at eSword and it had gave me the possibility to isolate any word in the Bible and, you know, do a biblical, like a Bible-wide search for that word. So I just went, I put in the word God's, so did a Bible-wide search, and then well, I'm going to print this, and I press print thinking, oh, I'll be like two or three pages. I'll quickly look at it. I mean, you know, what does the Bible have to say about about these mythological, you know, I'm still kind of devised, this is really... And so I printed it out, I pressed print, I'm watching the printer, so like, and just going and going, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and, and so I still have the printout all these years. They're here. Wow, wow. Yeah. And, and then I, I've several times sat down to count it. I, I always lose count after 600 verses. Um, like, you know, so I sat down at my desk, and in one shot, I read all of them. And I think that, that that's what my eyes needed. Having so much scripture about one topic beam into my consciousness, I, I got stood up and I now knew that they were real and that the Bible had much to say about them. Um, you know, the Bible admonished them. The Bible told them to praise God. Uh, the Bible judged them like in Exodus 12, 12. Yes, and yes. most important of all, kind of the, the verse that was that God was called the God of gods. And I was like, wait a second, the Lord can't be the leader of mythological beings. His name cannot be associated with, you know, their version of Mickey Mouse and Daffy Duck. You know, God did not come from, from you know, the, the, the temple, the heart of time and space, like Mark Flynn used to say, in order to judge uh, the figment of the imagination of the Egyptians, all right? And so I was like, okay, this this really you know shook my world. And as I was looking at these uh, passages, I noticed that next to the word uh, you know gods, there was a number four three zero, and I thought, I wonder what this number is. So I clicked on it, and it was Strong's Hebrew English Dictionary, mm-hmm. and the word was Elohim. And I read everything that that dictionary offered about the word, and I was like, oh wow, so that's what they're called. But wait, that's the name of God as well. And so this was the beginning of the breakthrough that led to bringing the whole documentary together. And so I was like, wait a second, so this term means angels? Because the gods of Egypt are called the Elohim Amitzchayim. And yet God is called Elohim. So wait, you know, as this can mean both then. So like when it says that man was made a little lower than the angels, it could also say man is made a little lower than God, which would be in harmony with mm-hmm. much of other things that are mentioned in other places in the Bible, including the book of Genesis, the writings of Paul, and the ultimate destiny of the human race. And so I thought, okay, so this was so the chariots, for instance, Rechev Elohim, like in the book of Psalms. Now I could see that, oh, these this these vehicles are actually uh, connected to the angels of God as well as to the angels right, of the okay. enemy. Uh, the, you know, uh, the, this was, I didn't realize that at this point that anybody else in the world was doing research in this stuff, uh, you know, and so significantly. But later I realized that people saw the UFO phenomenon mainly being about the fallen angels. Which yes, there's a lot of truth to that, but it's it's not a, it's not the correct picture. You know, it's like a lens. You have to have the right picture for all the pieces to fall together. This allowed me. Like it says in the beginning of the country, is the UFO phenomenon the evidence of the angelic reality? It was based on the idea that the chariots were associated with the Elohim, Rechev Elohim. It was based on that idea, and that's why I quoted these 
uh, verses in, in the Bible um, when we talk about it. And then as I was looking at these passages, I noticed another word. Once I once that got my attention that hey, this was important. I it was this was one of my favorite verses. This is in Joshua 22, 22, also uh, Deuteronomy 10:17 uh, is probably the foundation verse for this. The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, and the word here Lord had another number next to it, three six three zero six eight. So I clicked on that and it said Yahweh. And I realized, oh, I see, the name of God as revealed by Moses is, is, is translated as Lord in English. I now exactly right. know why and where it came from. It goes back to Hillel, uh, the teacher of Gamaliel, the grandfather of Gamaliel, who, who's in the New Testament. But regardless, so, um, the, so now I was reading it, Yahweh is the God of gods. And then I had to look up the word God, and that was 410, and that was El. Yahweh is the El Ha Elohim. Now it just my mind just it opened my mind. Now I had a different view of of this entire thing. He was the leader of this of these beings, which were called the Elohim. And they, they were the fallen angels, they were over the nations, and God was the leader of, of, of all of them. Uh, and his name was Yahweh because these guys had names as well. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. Moses says. They're going to tell me what's your name. And so he, he reveals himself as the one who is the eternal one. You know, you can see it any way you like. The I am that I am. And so, so now I saw him as the leader of a multitude of beings to, with which he was associated. And the, the these were huge revelations to me in my you know little uh, writing room. In each time I would find out these things, I'd have to sit like for an hour taking it in because so much of the Bible was being rewritten in my consciousness. At this point, I said to myself, okay, I wonder um, if is there a verse at the heart of this? Is there a biblical verse? Where did this come from? Where did this perspective appear in the whole Bible? I'm now convinced of it, Deuteronomy. 32, you know, talks about uh, the, the, the demons, the, the gods are not, the gods are devils, and Paul quotes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, and now I had that in my printout, and I could see, okay, so even Paul understood it this way, but where is the fundamental verse? And I think, again, this was from the Holy Spirit. As I was sitting pondering this question, I remember the words of Chuck Missler. You know, he's in my documentary, I had a relationship mm -hmm. with Chuck, I attended, you know, small Bible studies with him, at dinner with him, like... And so he used to call me my favorite, his favorite Iranian. So anyways, so <laughs> I, I, um, I remember Chuck's uh, words, and Chuck said, um, he used to say when he would do the Sons of God and Nephilim, he said, he used to say, there's one more passage where the term Sons of God is mentioned, but you have to read it in the Septuagint. And then he would read, he would say it, he would say, you know, it says this in, in, our, in the Masoretic text, and he would explain what the Masoretic text is, it says, you know, that when God divided the nations, you know, he, and set their borders, he did it according to the number of the sons of Israel. But um, in the Septuagint, it says sons of God, uh, which would make more sense, he would say. And then he would just stop right there and he would carry on, right? And I remembered the words of Chuck. So I ran to the same computer, to the ESER, and for the first time in my life, I looked up the Septuagint. Right. And I put that in and there it was. Now I had a foundational verse that explained the spiritual division that was at the heart of what I had discovered. Now I could see a line, you know, uh, in the documentary, I could now see that after the flood, this spiritual division occurred and these nations were given to the hand of these beings. And since at this point, I had done a tremendous amount of study uh, understanding what exactly was the relationship with these beings with the ancient nations. And of course, it had led me to Mesopotamia, which was the source of polytheism. And I could now see that a tremendous amount of worldview was pumped into the human world from these beings. And now I felt comfortable making the assessment that in our time, the fallen angels were rebranding as aliens in order, like, you know, the two gentlemen I have in the documentary, I mean, the documentary looked weird. There's a few guests. There's like a lot of typing because there was no one to interview. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and so and, and, but the gentleman that, I, that, you know, got me going on this, he said, I think that Satan's plan is to rebrand the Lord as an invading alien and gather the, 
the armies of the world against him. And when I talked to Chuck, he said the same thing. And I thought, okay, I think this is from the Holy Spirit. This is where we're going to take it. But where is the biblical foundation that allows him to say that Satan deceives the nations? Now, this understanding that the gods were real and that they had spoken into the ancient world, you know, gave me the permission to say that this has always been a part of the the, the story of humanity. And coming into the post-Holy Spirit era, of course, now I understood Islam in a new way. And I, did, I went ahead and, you know, recalibrated my understanding of the Quran by doing a systematic study of all the common themes that were in the Old and New Testament and the mm-hmm. Quran. And I noticed that, that actually this was an attack. Like, for instance, why is it that alcohol is banned? Well, because of the Passover cup. It, there, this was a conscious attack, you know, because the Quran has a lot of contradictions in it, and people were seeing it more. And I narrowed it down to the conversation between Satan and Eve, that there was the template that God had given us as to how to recognize the words that were coming from these beings against him. What does he do in that conversation? He first negates the commandment of God. What we what will happen? You will sure you will die. You know you will surely not die. You know he turns that he negates it. Mm-hmm. Then he replaces it with his own commandment, and you will become like one of the gods, knowing good from evil. And he adds a lie to a truth. the The part where he says you won't die is a lie, but the part where he says you will become like one of the gods is true because later God confirms that man has become like one of us. So, and um, basically that became the template for me. Taking that template now. I basically had now an encyclopedic understanding of, you know, the Enuma Elish, the Avesta, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, the, the the Code of Hammurabi, the writings of the gods. I mean, so many other things that are too, too small to mention, but are actually revelatory. And from there, I was able to see that the enemy was creating a competing worldview of the Bible. Things that I've talked about in groups, but I've never written about. And now I could explain that the modern world was once again going to come subject to massive deception because I could now show that this was a part of human history. And so I went ahead and now I made the documentary and now I had understood the word Elohim uh, as connecting both to God and angels. And now the chat, the vehicles connected to both the angels of God and to the fallen angels. I understood that, that the Elohim had going, the gods of the nations, were the sons of God of Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And so why are they called the sons of God there and the gods of the nations? My theory is that um, when God refers to them by their proper title that he gave to them, he refers to them as sons of God, like we see in the book of Job as well, uh, the three instances in the book of Job. Um, But uh, they took upon themselves uh, the desire to be idols. And that is what we see in Isaiah 14, where Satan declares himself um, as the one who wants to be worshipped, which is a source of idol worship. And the passages in, in, in these uh, writings that I printed out that said the gods were idols, I now had to also kind of you know reconcile that in Scripture because I was saying they were real, but there were passages that were saying no, they're idols. And so the reconciliation came from the first chapter of the Epistle of Rome, in which I felt that, uh, of the Romans, I, which, in which I felt Paul explained idol worship as the worship of the creation or the worship of the creator. He gave a very broad description. And so I, and that gave me the permission to say, yes, these are idols who are symbolizing these beings who had made themselves into idols. This was, this was the logic of the biblical worldview. And so now I had all the pieces of this puzzle, and I understood that you know they called themselves the gods of nations. So when God wanted to judge them, he referred to them by their title, by their chosen title. While he, when he wanted to reveal information to us about them, he called them sons of God. This was my theory. So I put the word Elohim in the actual title of the documentary, UFOs, which everyone knows what that is. Malachim, that's the angels, and Elohim. I now was aware of a slew of Hebrew words that, that none of my contemporaries would have understood. Even the word Nephilim, it was like, people were like, you got something stuck in your throat. <laughs> so, and, and then uh, 2006 came, we released a documentary on Google Video, it went viral, it became one of the most viewed things on Google Video. And where near where I worked and lived, um, a store opened up, and this store only sold magazines. And I, I was curious. I went in. I was looking at all the magazines. There was one that said Biblical Archaeology. Ah. I was like, right, that's right in my alley. And this was in 2006, the year that we released the documentary. So I picked it up, and it was this copy here. 
and has a picture of the altar of Zeus on uh, it. And uh-huh. it says, Satan's throne. And I thought, wow, I can't, what? Someone else talked about it? So I bought the article, basically ran home to read it. And it was an interview with Adela Collins, a professor of theology from Yale Seminary. Very detailed, very good. And she talked about this altar. And yes, she did make a connection to the idea of the throne of Satan. And then she said, when the Most High gave each nation's heritage, declares Deuteronomy 32, 8, when he divided all mankind, he laid down the boundaries for people according to the sons of Israel. A Dead Sea Scroll fragment containing this verse above, however, has the phrase sons of God instead of sons of Israel. The Dead Sea Scroll fragment apparently retains a more original form of the text. The Septuagint, uh, the 3rd, 2nd century BC translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek also has sons of God. The early church father, Justin Martyr, apparently used a text that preserved sons of God, believed these sons of God were angels to whom God had entrusted the care of human beings. But now this blew my mind. Not only was the oldest Greek copy of the Bible saying this, but the oldest written Hebrew copy right, right. was also saying this. And I learned that in 2006 from Adela Collins. And I saw this as a great confirmation. I could rest at peace because believe it or not, I was concerned about the things I was releasing into the world <laughs> on behalf of God. Like I did, I I felt that the Lord had taken me on a revelation journey, and it was my duty to inform the church. However, I, um, uh, you know, part of me was like, am I crazy or am I right? And well, so, yeah, as I said, when you're the first one whose head is over the wall with, a, hey, I've got this new thing here, uh, everybody's going to, you know, you're, you become a target. But more than that, you feel a sense of responsibility. I mean, um, yeah. as our friend Doug Petrovich has said, you know, am I the only one who's seeing this? And if so, is it because I want to see it or it's because it's true? Exactly. And that's why when I saw... The work of Dr. Heiser and, and you know his you know he's he's on a whole level level he's is this academic so and your work it gave me frankly the boldness to start talking about this because I felt there was a confirmation from the Holy Spirit because you know I I in the back of my mind I mean I was going on show after show and people would talk about the Nephilim always I mean I would have to email people and say please ask me about this and 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 I would I would review my documentary say my I didn't really actually put in this, but the whole section is dedicated, and I give examples, the Queen of Heaven, the decree of a Diocletian uh, from Apollo, um, and many, many, many verses uh, that, that make it clear, as well as people saying it, that these are the fallen angels. I didn't explain this Deuteronomy 32, and then all, all of the Hebrew and all that, because, you know, you can't burden the documentary. The goal was to explain the modern UFO deception. These were the pieces of the puzzle. So I had to come up, understand the Nephilim, understand the modern day abductions. You know, I went and saw Dr. Jacobs and how that fit into the whole thing. So it's so it's important to understand that once you put in the word Elohim, as we did in its proper place, your view changes. First of all, you start to understand that these vehicles are associated with the world of God and angels as a whole not just the fallen angels. That is why it becomes possible to theorize that the that the Lord and his armies returning to the earth can be um, rebranded as an alien invasion. And so, as it says in Psalm 2, the kings of the earth gather against... Because it, actually this is, you know, there, there were other people, and, and I see now that these people are still talking, um, who, who believe that, you know, there's this... Um, uh, the deception is that, you know, the angels are just spirits, and the deception is to even create the whole idea uh, of these heavenly craft, and that the, that the world of God and angels has no association with it. And um, anyways, so basically, um, this is one important point that falls into place once you understand the, the concept of Elohim. You understand where the deception is headed to, so that's an important piece of the puzzle. And when you understand the connection between the, the the sons of God or the gods of the nations and the past, you understand the birth of civilization. You understand how is it that the devil and his, you know, or the, the whole world of fallen angels have been deceiving the nations. And how is it that the Lord sent not his son, but also his Torah, his teachings, his instructions into the nations to push back this. And why is it that the days of Noah understood correctly is not the days of the Nephilim, but the days of the sons of God, of which mm-hmm. the Nephilim are only one uh, part of the pieces of the puzzle is the days of the sons of God and the sons of God did many things to the human world of which the creation of hybrids was one mm-hmm. and, and so the Lord mentions that in the parable of the wheat and tares which we put in the documentary 
I believe. Um, but to, um, it's one piece of the puzzle. The knowledge that they spoke into the world, going back to the book of Enoch, we see that knowledge was handed down, and we see that that happened afterwards, um, and this is why we have, and this is one of the reasons I, I couldn't divide the topic in my mind. I saw it as a whole from Mesopotamia to today, and if I were to write about this, I knew I'd have to write about Islam. Uh, because, you know, I've now done a Torah study, not only comparing the Quran to the Bible from this, you know, adversarial perspective. So I had was able to prove it, but also the understanding of the crescent of the moon and how it related to all of this. And, and you know, going back to Nanar Sin or, you know, Nanar right. and Sin, like the two guys, the two names uh, mm-hmm. put together to create one name. The, the, Mes- the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian uh, names for this moon god and, and, and the temple like is the Ziggurat in Ur. And, and how did he fit inside of, you know, the world of fallen angels? Who was he? How did he fit in all of that? I couldn't talk about these things because I was going to Iran to see my dad. Mm-hmm. And I know mm-hmm. that the intelligence services there is not like, this is this is not a militia. It's not like, you know, Hezbollah or, or Hamas or anything. This, these guys are an imperial power. They have an imperial inheritance. They're organized. They're professional. They're professional, right? So... So you can't just, you know, if you're going to write something and, and it's going to be, let's say, explosive and it gets into the ears of these guys, you won't make it past the airport. Uh, you're like a Salman Rushdie suddenly, you know, yeah, you're saying yeah. that this is a satanic verse. So I couldn't divide the topic in my mind and just say, let's talk about the ancient world. I saw it as one giant revelation, uh, the queen of heaven coming into because how was it that? These guys had reinvented after the time of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. That was a, a, a huge part of my research. And now I could see from the days of Mesopotamia all the way to our time, a linear. Of course, I don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. But no, but this, this, but this is really interesting to me, too, because that was what prompted my book, Bad Moon Rising. How did, yes. the, uh, how did these old entities, these uh, uh, Elohim who had rebelled against God, how did they reinvent themselves in the centuries after the resurrection? Because... Paul writes that if the uh, archons, if the rulers of the age, the archons of the age had understood the mystery that was being revealed through the apostles and the prophets, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Yes. They didn't. They did. He resurrected. They didn't expect that. What did they do? And that, uh, if plan I were to, B. Yeah, well, that plan B, exactly. And, and now, if I were to rewrite the book today, which I probably will, because I've come to a different conclusion about the nature of Allah, uh, I'd, I'd have some some new insights, I think. But uh, right. I, I'm really curious. What, what I mean, the Queen of Heaven obviously is part of that, because uh, the ancient Inanna Ishtar Astarte, yes, Aphrodite exactly. Venus, is clearly a very influential entity. Yes, she's all still, the way to this day. To this day, and, I mean, she's and still she's worshipped female, as... Which tells us there are female angels. You, you know that in some Hebrew translations, when they want to avoid sons of God, because that's too close to the Christian concept, uh, they will say the male angels, the male heavenly beings, mm, mm-hmm. which is, you know, because they're sons, but uh, maybe there are females uh, as well. The Queen of Heaven is the only one that we really no off with certainty she stands out um but yes, when you but go back to her out. oldest iterations as inanna and ishtar there are yes. sumerian hymns that praise her for being able to change men into women and women into men and sometimes she manifests as a male the hurrian form of uh, inanna shaushkar is depicted on a very famous uh, inscription where all of the hurrian deities the hurrians were people who um they think Indo-European, but they don't know. They lived in northern, basically the Kurdish regions of uh, Syria and Iraq back in yes. uh, uh, the kingdom of Mitanni and before, going back to about 3500 BC. Anyway, their deities yes. are depicted on a very famous inscription with all the men on one side and all the women on the other. But Shaushka, Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte yes. is on both okay. sides because she's so male and female. A, you made a good point here, which is... In someone who's researching this, how do we know how much of the pagan information and the myths that humans created about these things we can trust. Sure. And say, so, how, you know, we can say that's interesting, but we need confirmation from any other sources. And of course, what does the Bible say? Since the book of Jeremiah refers to her as the Queen of Heaven. Right. And which competes with the Bride of Christ. Right. Because, you know, in, in a sense, you know, we, if he's the king, you know, his bride is the queen. And so in that sense, um, that is the title that she prefers, Inanna, which is a translation of that. And uh, as you said, from the city of Uruk, where she ruled and she revealed to the scribes um, the basis of Sumerian writing, which uh, the purpose of it was to record Mm -hmm. uh, the teachings of the gods. 
uh, which are the algorithms of knowledge that have shaped the human civilization. As right. I say in the documentary, you know, all civilizations attribute their genesis to the gods. And I show all these scriptures thinking my audience would go, yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, now I look back 20 years later going, okay, the people are like, it was just like, Hume. You know, it was <laughs> the connections, I, you know, were not, were not happening. But regardless, so... So there she's a female entity, that, and, and she's called the Queen of Heaven, and, and she you know, continues in that light with Ishtar Atharite, and of course this resurgence in, in Catholicism, the Marian movement, right. uh, and all the appearances that she makes, uh, I, you know, I, I made those connections in the documentary, and I once in a while get that little pointed email from a Catholic person who basically says, I stopped watching it, you know, when I got to that sure. show, or, or I just want you to know, we're, we're not venerating, we're not adoring, we're venerating, I'm like, okay. So regardless, it's not about culture, it's not about people, it's about humans' search for truth and knowledge. Everyone is born in a culture, regardless, but my focus is the Word of God and revealing the contents of the Bible. I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, I want all people to know the truth. I'm just simply a researcher, and this is where my research has led me to. Um, so she's she's a very important entity. Um, I think that... that um, uh, Enki and Enlil continue to be very powerful. Um, um, there is um, re research that I I'm going to be putting in a book. This uh, this is you know when you have this knowledge, uh, this this uh, um, uh, insight in the Bible, you start to see thin things all over the place. And it's interesting, but the question is, what do you want to share, you know, with everybody else? Like the, the episode to Ephesians or uh, the seven churches, many things start to change for you. But um, the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece, that is what I'm going to be writing about. Ah, that's a fascinating subject. And I, I've been, yes. Sharon and I have talked about that, about who might these entities be? Yeah. And how are they influencing the world today? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the... the in, that that's going to be so the question is you know my focus is which ones are mentioned in the bible mm -hmm. um i think uh, from some of the things i've read from your articles you've done an, an excellent job in finding the words that translators were um uh, you know were trying to be helpful in translating it as like you know play or you know uh, <laughs> yeah no oh money uh, it's like no just don't change the bibles these mean things uh, they're not just cultural idioms they actually refer to the world of angels like even the whole idea that uh, there'll be a covenant with shaul you know the covenant with death right but that passage actually refers to one of these entities which sure, would make sure. sense now if there's going to be because Israel was instructed not to have any covenants with the nations and their gods, yet prophetically we are told that they're going to have one. So it's not just a peace accord with the with the world uh, in the modern state of Israel. It is an actual covenant. It's it's going against the laws of the Torah, and and things like that. So these are you know interesting revelations on the way. But the I think the the Lord has now opened up uh, a new stage of this for me, and I'm very excited to share that. Uh, with the church, especially now that there's an audience and I don't have to always start from scratch and say, okay, there's a verse. It's not found in any of the Bibles that you have. It's found in this ancient Bible. And, and the conversation kind of just goes down from there. Right, and, right. And it just, by the time you finish explaining that, you're like, all, you know, all your energy has been extended. So you can't really actually show the insights you've gained from that point of view. But now... Uh, thanks to the tremendous ministry of you, Dr. Heiser, and other well, people, such such an audience. We, we don't deserve to be mentioned in the same breath with Mike Heiser, but uh, <laughs> thankfully some Bible scholars are picking up on this, and the, some of the newer translations like the ESV, the Net Bible, yes. the New English Translation, which we find very helpful, because the translator's notes are so extensive, and you can see what they wrestled with and why they decided to translate certain things certain ways. Those newer translations get Deuteronomy 32, Yes. And it's because of the discovery of things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, and, and referring to the Septuagint for comparison's sake. So uh, we're, we're seeing yes. Yes. This, this understanding now coming into our Bibles and our Bible studies. We just need to get the word to the uh, to the church. Well, so, what are you working? on? Where do people follow your work, Ali? Where, where do uh, okay? So, so the, lately, I've been trying this approach, and it's working well. I have a patron account. Ah, excellent. So, uh, yeah, patron.com/slash. Think Again Productions. Ah. 
And there I have an audio series on the book of Revelation, which people are really enjoying. And so you can, you know, you can sign up. There's no tier system. Just donate as the Lord has blessed you. And you have access to all my videos and audios that I'm posting there. Um, and, of course, there's my website, thinkingandproductions.com where you can watch my documentary for free. There's a donation button at the bottom. If you want to leave a donation, you're free to do that. It can be a one-time donation. And you can sign up for my newsletter. It says stay informed. So thinkagainproductions.com is the website. Don't hesitate to email me. If you want to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, it's at UFOs Angels Gods. That's the handle on both. And and, and I'd love to hear from you. And, and if I have time, I, I answer all the questions that I get. Um, so that's how people can find me. And this is so important, this information, because it is eschatologically relevant. It is being revealed to this generation because we need it to understand the world in which we live and where the world is headed to. And the time of the Reformation, there was massive revelation. And I think this is yet another time where we're getting a new wave of revelation from God. But this time it's concerning the return of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Ali Siadatan, uh, his website, thinkagainproductions.com. I'll put links in the show notes wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast. You can find it. Uh, go there. Also put a link to his uh, Patreon page. Uh, Ali, uh, thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, it's been too long since you've been on because I remember when we talked before, it was a fascinating and very, very fast moving 45 minutes or thereabouts. So uh, thank you again. We appreciate that. We look forward to the time when uh, our governments sort of open up that border and we can start uh, getting, because we would love to meet you face to face one of these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. God willing. The show notes are at vftb.net. If you're watching this podcast, you'll find it at youtube.com slash Gilbert House. And uh, you'll find the uh, link to Ali's uh, website and Patreon page in the notes below. Of course, you can also get the uh, Gilbert House mobile app. That app gets you all of our video content, not just this program, but our weekly Bible study, which is uh, audio only, but uh, then Sci Friday and Unraveling Revelation as well, delivered right to your smartphone or tablet, whether it's iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle, Fire, phones and tablets. Works for all of those, and you'll find a link to the app stores for the, the, the app that's correct for your device at gilberthouse.org slash app. You'll, you'll see that link here on the page, on the screen. If you're just listening, well, just, again, go to the show notes. Go to the website, gilberthouse.org. A couple of quick conferences to tell you about. Um, uh, the Dark Secrets and Bright Hopes Conference coming up in just a couple of weeks in Live Oak, California. I'll be there speaking with L.A. Marzulli, uh, Dr. Brian Artis, and Pastor Dave Bryan, who is a deliverance minister, uh, actually puts a word right out there, calls himself an exorcist. That's at the website, Church of Glad Tidings in Live Oak, California, that's just north of Sacramento by about 45 minutes, September 16th through 18th, that is, September 16th through 18th. And uh, hope to see you there. I understand there will be streaming video and it will be recorded, so we'll have video that we can share after the event. But uh, if you're in California... Please try to make the trip. I'd love to see you when we get out there. And then we're coming to the Louisville area in October. Sharon and I are part of a uh, an advanced spiritual warfare training workshop. This is at uh, David Hefner's facility in Jeffersonville, Indiana, which is just north, just across the river from Louisville. And uh, we'll be there October 14th through 16th, along with L.A. Marzulli, David Hefner, of course, Tom Dunn of Through the Black Ministries, Vicki Anderson, author of the important new book, which is on my side table over there. They only come out at night. Going to talk to her about that soon. Need to make connections with her. But uh, we saw her at the Go Therefore conference in Ohio. And it's good to see her getting out and talking about this uh, very important topic. L.A. has had uh, had Vicki on his program talking about the book and... Uh, as well he should, because uh, L.A. is the publisher of the book. Uh, but uh, Vicki will be there along with uh, Sonda Allison and Tracy Tennant. And this entire weekend, spiritual warfare training is devoted to the medic- they're dedicated to the memory of uh, Russ Dizdar, uh, Russ and Shelley, faithful servants of the Lord. And uh, we are sad that we miss them in this life, but uh, can guarantee that they would not trade places with any of us right now, as uh, they are in glory. So uh, you can find out more at the website of Hear the Watchman, hearthewatchman.com. Again, that's October 14th through 16th at uh, David Hevner's facility. It, it's uh, an old church, basically. He bought an old church and he's using it to do some of the filming for, uh, uh, for his series, The Last Evangelist. And you'll see that at davidhevener.tv. So uh, look for you in October. Thank you for, oh, by the way, uh, still uh, time to sign up for the uh, tour of Israel. 
Sharon and I, along with our good friends, uh, Allie Henson and Donna Howell from Skywatch TV, the co-host of the Simply His program, and uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat joining us in Israel, March 19th through 30th, with the four-day extension over to Jordan, three-day extension to Jordan. Uh, just t- take a look at the itinerary, and, and then just tell us that, you know, that that is not the most unique tour of Israel ever. Going to archaeological sites like Joshua's Altar, Shiloh Gilgal Rephaim, on top of all the places that you want to see, like Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, and so forth. The itinerary is posted there. You can find uh, the link for, and also link to our uh, travelogue umentaries. So if you want to get an idea in advance of what it's like, uh, streaming video, it's available through, they are available through streaming video now. We've got a new streaming video site, uh, gilberthouse.org slash travel. You'll find that at gilberthouse.org and uh, check out our new streaming video site. Got to put a link to that. In, on the website, but uh, by the time you see this, it will be there. Uh, we are now making available video on demand, and uh, these are essentially many of the videos that we've got available for DVD in our store, but uh, when you stream it, uh, first of all, you get instant access, and secondly, you get it in full HD instead of in, uh, uh, well, you get it in HD anyway, instead of uh, DVD quality, which is uh, much, much more compressed. So uh, anyway, check that out. Thank you for watching, taking time out of your schedule to do so wherever uh, wherever that might be. If you're listening, I appreciate you doing that too. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer is the inimitable DC Good, and A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, High Commercial, No Derivatives 4.0, International License. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Bunker.